Um, I have two panelists joining me on stage, and I have the pleasure of bringing them now. Um, first of all is the Senior Vice President and Deputy Director General, International Airport and Transport Association, IATA, Mr. Conrad Clifford. Please, a round of applause. And I like how two women will be ganging up against him. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the Chief Executive Officer, Pacific Asia Travel Association, PATA, Liz Ortiguera. Thank you. Have a seat. We must have these difficult conversations. We must look our problems in the <laughs> eye because that is actually where and how we're going to find solutions to the problems. First, Acknowledging that we have issues, nailing them down, and then giving them an uppercut, basically. Let me quickly just give a background about the topic we're having today. We know that the global economy is becoming more and more connected. And as a result, the aviation industry has become one of the strategic drivers of international trade and tourism. According to latest statistics, hear this, the aviation industry provides a total of 87.7 million jobs worldwide and directly generates employment opportunities within the airlines, air navigation services providers and airport operators, including via the supply chain in the transportation of goods and services. Unfortunately, the aviation industry was among the industries most hit by the coronavirus pandemic the pandemic erased two decades of growth in only a couple of months. We heard uh, the Minister of um, Tourism saying during the pandemic, there was only one six tourist in Bali. One six, not 60, 16. And that for me was pretty much mind boggling. And over two million jobs lost, I also heard. <clears throat> The reduced passenger demand led to a drastic decrease in passenger traffic, less flights performed, and airlines and airports reporting huge losses. Thankfully, the increase in air connectivity among Southeast Asian nations has provided a soft landing for businesses and also eased tourist movement. And as we heard, the minister said earlier, people are coming back to Bali. But let's face it, we are not there yet. And so that's why I have my two distinguished panelists. Um, they're going to be talking about what that was like and what the way forward is. But first I'd like to ask you, my audience, to please put your phone on silent or vibration so that we can all hear each other. And at some point you're going to be asking these wonderful panelists questions. So if you have any questions, we're going to make this as interactive as possible. Is that okay? Now let's start. I'll start you with you, Mr. Conrad. Are we out of the woods yet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is the world back on its feet? <laughs> and if not, how long more are we gonna be crawling for? Yeah, thanks very much, Adesewa. And, uh, and it's very nice to be here, by the way. It's wonderful to be in Bali. And, um, and I love the fact that we're having this meeting physically and face to face. I think that's tremendously important. Are we out of the woods yet? No, we're not. Um, but it, it depends where you are in the world. So um, in America in September, 89%, um, we were at 89% of pre-COVID levels, so almost back to normal for North America. Um, in the rest of the world, we were between 70 and 80% back to where we were pre-COVID. <coughs> but here in Asia, in September, we were at only 46% of where we were pre-COVID. So there's a long way to go in Asia. Um, there have recently been some very, very good um, uh, developments with uh, Japan opening, Korea removing restrictions, other countries removing restrictions. That's all good news. Um, but the elephant in the room, or the elephant that's not in the room, is of course China. Um, and we need to see China come back um, as, a, as a fully opened market. Um, and uh, we really hope that will happen as soon as possible. The, um, the state of the airlines is, um, as we come out of COVID, is pretty weak. So we lost about $200 billion over the last two years as an industry. Uh, there's a lot of debt, a lot of owings that airlines have as they come out of this period. Um, so airlines are pretty weak. Mm. Uh, but the good news is that we have seen enormous pent-up demand. Um, and 
this is uh, really pushing airlines to bring back capacity as fast as they possibly can. So we are actually seeing some good results from a number of airlines um, as they've re-entered and restarted service. So I think the outlook is very good. Uh, it's pretty challenging. Uh, oil is at an all-time high, so that's pushing prices up. Yep. Um, but overall, because of that really strong pent-up demand, uh, the, the outlook for tourism is, is excellent. I'm going to ask Liz to quickly jump in. Are we out of the woods? And uh, <coughs> if not, how long more? First of all, I'll say I'm really honored to be here. I had the privilege of first coming to Bali in 1996. Wow. And back then, I felt like I saw true Bali. It was very easy to see and appreciate the spirituality, the artistic nature, and the beauty of the Balinese culture. So um, I've been a fan. I've been living in Asia most many 23 years since then and so um so i have a deep love for bali and uh, indonesia in general um are we out of the woods what i tell people and i'll use your aviation terminology we are if we were a plane we would be ascending but facing headwinds and tailwinds and the destination has changed now while our metrics on international visit arrivals mirror yours mm. the same they're not the <clears throat> what I would, what we advocate is actually that's not the only measure now, and I would say that emerging from this pandemic, there are so many silver linings which are actually wonderful, and I think you know, um, I would say that many of our values and philosophies and actions as Pata are very aligned with Minister Uno's priorities, you know, when it comes to things like community-based tourism, um, or even I'll start, you know, vaccine equity. A year and a half ago when I started in this job, I found that to be foundational and critical, and it continues to be. You know, so elements of that, health and safety. So there are all these elements that um, <coughs> we're challenges, and we're still in progress, and we still need to continue to manage our risk, but there are so many positives, too, that are coming out of this. And I don't think volume of visitors is, is the whole, that's not the only criteria right now. Right. It's important, but there are several other measures that yeah. need to be considered. You know, the minister mentioned, said something about, are we going to return to quality patronage or quantity? And I was like, oh, wow, I never saw it that way. But before we, we move on, because this is going to be an, uh, an, an interesting session, you said something about um, recovery in Asia still not there yet. Mm. And you compared it with the South America and a couple other places. Why is it slower here? Uh, because the, the um, government's attitude towards reopening has been much more conservative. So we've had closed markets for much longer in this part of the world than we've had in other areas. The first market to really open up was the USA. <coughs> um, and then that was uh, followed by Europe. Um, and if you think about Japan, that only really opened up about a month and a half ago. So, for example, and China is, is still closed. So it's more conservative. Okay. And what do you think? Do you think it's a is a terrible idea to be conservative? Um, I think the I, I think the big problem with the pandemic is you have to um, balance off the social and economic damage caused by lockdowns right. with the the health threat mm -hmm. and also with the health impact. So we've done quite a lot of studies, um, or we've commissioned studies into uh, how did lockdowns affect the, uh, the, the spread of the disease and the onset of the peak. Um, and we can only find about three days difference between a locked down situation and an unlocked down situation mm. because of the nature of the virus. So I think, I think with hindsight, you have to question whether locking down is, is the right strategy or not. We're all asking that same question. Lisa, uh, let's just face it, um, the pandemic has reshaped how we connect. And that's a fact. At the very least, it's made us aware of the choices available through technology, including teleporting <laughs> through <laughs> metaverse. <laughs> um, so when we're talking about reconnecting to recover, <coughs> what will that look like post pandemic? Oh, it'll look very different. Um, and first of all, I think globally people will agree that you know there there's virtual is great and it's efficient but it doesn't replace um real life interaction I and it am doesn't with replace you, on that one. you know and i you know the metaverse um, <laughs> demo was really interesting um but you know 
and particularly as people who love travel and support this industry, we know that it's a substitute for the real thing. So, you know, tech should be an accessory, an enabler, have, having people experience the real thing. And, um, and so I guess that's the, you know, that's the view. And it, there is a lot of pent up demand. Um, trust can only be truly built. You know, if you think about the, the big contracts and the deals, you know, one hotel in uh, Manila told me, we've never seen so many CEOs come through. They're coming through because there's a lot of pent up need for people to connect in person in order to get, you know, um, relationship driven commerce started, um, as well as the, the leisure travel experiences. Okay, before we go on, there's still a phone that's beeping. Um, please, let's keep it on silent, please. Silent or vibration. Thank you. You wanted to jump in on um, my question to Liz about, oh my God, that phone. Let's <laughs> <laughs> find that somewhere. Can I, I'd, I'd love to add one more thing to you about your question. Okay, go uh, on, please, regarding please. Regarding the, the foundation to the conservatism of this region. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> my background is east and west, and my first career was as a scientist in uh, pharma. And so I'm very, I'm prob I probably have studied this virus more than most travel people. And I do, and, and I'm also, you know, I'm American in terms of that ideology around individual rights, but I've been in Asia for a long time. And the thing that I do value, and I think that the time and the effort invested, and I have to applaud Indonesia because your vaccination rate, you vaccinated like the number four volume in the world. Mm. And that was a, amazing. amazing. <laughs> Your vaccination rates, and I've seen different stats, I've seen they're definitely over 80, 85 percent. That surpassed what U.S. could do with all their funding and, and the fact that the vaccine, you know, came from there. So it was, a, so to, for me, what I would say is that that was foundational and I think it's, it's actually going to, it supports the sustainability of our industry in this region because it's more of a community attitude. And it's more, you know, people take care of each other. They have respect. It's not as politicized. And so when it comes to masking, when it, co when it comes to health and safety and vaccinations, there is more consideration. Um, and I can see all the positives of that for our industry. Oh, okay. So, I mean, the trade-off was worth it then. Because then that <coughs> means that sort of, in real terms, translated to slower recovery. But I guess stronger is better than faster? I think I think so. And the thing is, you know, if you look at the death rates for, you know, many countries in Asia that are less developed than the US, they're lower. And the people don't view it as such a mental anguish to wear a mask. They consider it, you know, yes, it can be annoying sometimes, but there's a more of a sense of community and consideration. Thank you. Uh, Clifford, you wanted to jump in on the initial question I was asking about um, what reconnecting will look like post-pandemic? So I think that what uh, the ministers were saying earlier about really uh, recovering stronger, better, um, and rethinking um, the whole experience is, is correct. Because coming back, we've got to do this sustainably. And we actually have, a ch uh, we have an opportunity to do this as we come back. So um, that's one of the reasons that the airlines and, and now ICAO are getting behind this 2050 net zero target because we're really signaling um, that we have a roadmap, it's with SAS, sustainable fuel, um, and that we have a way to make this industry sustainable. And we really should pour efforts, money, investments um, into making it sustainable for the long term. There's a kind of a, it's quite an interesting, there's a sort of a difference in opinion maybe between parts of Europe and parts of the rest of the world. The attitude in some parts of Europe is that we should just cut the industry off. Um, mm. But the, but really, uh, cut the uh, industry off. Mm. Cut it down because it's, it's. You <coughs> what want are we going to be doing? Exactly. Well, uh, uh, totally. So, but that's that's <laughs> no. that's that's the that's that's what's happening in some countries. They're saying we should reduce flights, we should reduce activity because we need to decarbonize and just teleport and ju <laughs> yes, or just <laughs> okay. go virtual. But that's uh, actually that's not the solution. And I think what the what the ministers were talking about earlier uh, earlier today is correct. We need to rethink. And we need to find a way to a sustainable future that's going to be better for everybody. Well, you know, that's why we have this forum. We're all going to talk through the solution. We've, we've got to find a way, a middle ground. Um, I don't see us not traveling. I, oh, please don't give me a heart attack. <laughs> I love to travel. <laughs> you know, I love to see the world. I'm a true citizen of the world. The best education I can ever give myself and my family is to just go, just 
find a country on the map and just take them out and then see the world. Nothing, nothing compares to that. But also the, the cost of traveling has become really very expensive because of uh, the unprecedented energy crisis driven by the Russia, Ukraine, um, the Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And everything has just become really, really expensive. Mr. Conrad, what sort of pressure does this put on your recovery strategies? And, and what are your backup plans should the Russia-Ukraine crisis linger? I think By the way, you know, buying a ticket here was very expensive. It was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah. I couldn't afford a business class, which was really, really sad. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm sorry about that. The, um, no, so, so um, I mean, there are two things. Um, the price of oil is, is, an, uh, is an all time record high, and that's the biggest single cost element for any, any airline fuel. So that's pushed up prices dramatically. Um, and then the other thing is that there isn't enough capacity in many markets at the moment. Mm -hmm. So that's also pushing up prices, and that's not a situation that we want to see continuing. So we have to try and get more capacity back into the market. And of course, we would like to see a resolution of the Russian-Ukraine situation that would bring down the cost of, of fuel. Those two things would really help a lot. The other thing that's um, pushing up uh, capacity or reducing capacity at the moment is uh, MRO availability and spare parts. Um, as the ramp up's been so fast, as we've come out of the uh, pandemic with all this pent up demand, um, it's very difficult to get spare parts, it's very difficult to get time in MROs to recommission aircraft. And that also reduces capacity, which also pushes prices up. So I think this, um, we will get through this, this situation, but it'll probably take another 12 to 18 months before we can get back to back to where we were before the pandemic. Well, that's a realistic, um, that's a realistic timing, I think. Mm. Uh, Liz, intra-Asian tourism has become one of the key drivers of the region's economic growth post-pandemic. Mm. Are there plans for an intra-Asian aviation alliance? Oh, well, that might be in more that in your More realm. him <laughs> than you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> then, then I've got one for you. Okay. <laughs> Just quickly. Uh, uh, so, I mean, there are, there are, there's a lot of work that's been going on at ASEAN in particular in trying to build a sort of an ASEAN open market. That would be tremendously beneficial. And the, uh, the deal that they just struck with the EU, a block-to-block -block deal, um, previously there were 140 individual air services agreements between European countries and ASEAN countries. So that's going to make that whole opportunity to increase capacity a lot more effective. Um, and if they can do similar things within the ASEAN bloc, that's a really, that would be a tremendous move. Right. So, uh, so yes, I think everybody would like to see I that. I kind of saw you uh, wanting to jump in on the on the previous um, energy question. On the energy question. Yes, yeah. on the energy going up and what w you know, what we need to do to um, to make sure that things get better. Well, your concern about you know, and I, I appreciate the movement in Europe, and they call it flight shaming. Mm. Um, but oh. you know, it doesn't. I like that flight shaming. Yeah, that's it. So. <coughs> Huh. And maybe, you know, Greta might have, you know, right inspired there. some of that too. <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily mean um, no travel, you know. And I, I do think, you know, transport has many forms. And I do think that one of the um, silver linings is, you know, the, the greater appreciation that people have for domestic tourism. The greater appreci that appreciation they have for secondary, tertiary, lesser known destinations, less crowded. You know, and I know that, you know, Indonesia is working hard at making some of the other beautiful al alternatives to Bali better known. And so, um, you know, there are ways, you know, it, and I do believe that rather than take, you know, Americans love their cars, but rather than embrace a car all the time, rail systems are important. Um, mm -hmm. You know, flights and connectivity, yes, are important, but, you know, there are other forms of transportation too. So it doesn't necessarily mean um, <coughs> no travel. Yeah, which is at your fear. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so basically, you're saying that we should consider more intra-region tra uh, regional travel. Think continue for to domestic, get continue intra-regional. Mm -hmm. And then I, you know, to your point about long haul being very price prohibitive mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that um, one of the recovery strategies is really the markets within Asia Pacific learning to market to new source markets, mm -hmm. particularly within the region, sh shorter haul. <coughs> in the in in replacement of you know the accessible airfares for long haul. That makes sense. Okay, I um in the next 
five minutes, I'm going to be asking you, our wonderful audience, to ask questions. I'm going to take like two or three questions. Um, so if you have any questions, just be on standby and somebody's going to give you a mic. All right, this is for Liz again. In the likely event of a new normal <coughs> in the aviation industry uh, that is probably shaped by new technologies, passengers' behavior are changes, and it is happening, there's a lot of that happening, and a gloomy economic turn, what adaptation strategies do you think will weather the storm and keep us all connected still? Now, perhaps, uh, maybe not reconnection, but maybe creating new connection? Mm -hmm. Maybe not waking <coughs> up the dead, maybe it's creating something else, like what is it, what is it gonna be? Um, well, you mentioned uh, s spare parts and supply yeah. constraints. W the big elephant in the room is also staffing and making our industry more desirable to return back to or to, re to join for the first time. And, um, you know, and that's, that's the other capacity constraint that we've got in terms of the recovery. Mm -hmm. And while the wave hit North America and Europe harder, we're feeling it here in Asia Pacific now too. And just imagine when China comes back online, you know, we're going to be capacity constrained. Um, in all, in all, in our mega sector, which consists of multiple industries. So I think the important thing is, um, <coughs> you know, to, we need to, to work on culture, we need to make it more, um, work on corporate culture, work culture, and um, one critical policy would be zero tolerance for abuse against employees. There needs to be mutual respect between guests, travelers, and our staff. And I think that's a critical element that, you know, that needs to, and it's, it's a tough one, but it is actually, you know, customer is not always king when they're being unreasonable and abusing our staff. Mm. They're not king. That's not even talked about a lot. Do you, you want to give more insight <coughs> uh, to that? Like, do you see that well, a lot? Like, see abusive behavior? Yeah. And, and well, how it's gotten worse. You know, we hear it, it's stories in aviation. People are more stressed, um, you know, coming out of the pandemic. And yes, there are Is challenges. that part of the behavior change we're talking about? Or has this been a, pand a pandemic in your I industry? I think it's gotten, you know, I think it, 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 across industries, it's it reported it's gotten worse. Wow. You know, the, the, the behavior in hospitality, in F&B, in aviation. And, you know, who even if you raise the you know, the salaries, who wants to be abused every day no. by angry, angry travelers? And sometimes, and you know, and it's, it's difficult. Yes, you know, you can get stressed out, um, you know, if your, your flight is super delayed, your luggage is lost. Um, but I think there needs to be a norm of mutual respect. I think that's really important for our industry in order mm. to attract people back. I really wish we had time to explore that. But we, we certainly, we saw, and, and Liz probably knows this, we saw a, an <coughs> uptick, particularly in passengers attacking crew over the requirement to wear masks, and particularly in, in, in uh, North America. Uh, yeah, there so was a lot of that. So, but as, as those mask mandates have been removed, that, that problem really has obviously has gone away. So, um, so, so, so that's, a, that's a problem solved, really. I'm going to ask you both for your final words, but first let's ask the audience if they have anything for you. Anybody with a question? Go on, ask any question, including if you're going to get your flight tickets uh, <laughs> free back home. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that should be that, but hey, they, we were just talking about capacity not being there and, and what have you and all. Oh, there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for the pretty lady. Tell us your name, where you're from, and your question. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Glenn. Can we please increase the volume of her yeah. microphone? Yes, uh, my name is Mani Vidya. I have uh, running the company uh, Aviation here as a consultant for aviation. And then um, I was asking about uh, how, how uh, how far that you uh, have a solution for the aviation, like a tourism. We are here in helicopter tourism here, just starting. And then we hear from you that you carrying, carrying out the traveling for, from the airline. So we are expecting the gas is coming from anywhere now. So what is the solution for us? 
uh, expecting that kind of situation. No, so, yeah, no, sure. Um, we're not cutting the airlines or passengers at all. I was actually talking about governments. So, um, and I'll give you an example. Schiphol in, in Holland, uh, the government wants to implement a 20% reduction in the number of flights in and out of that airport for environmental reasons. Um, so, uh, but, but I, I honestly think that this is something that's relevant for Europe. I don't really see it as relevant for other parts of the world, and I, I certainly wouldn't oh. say it's relevant for Asia Pacific. So I would say for your helicopter business, the, yeah. the outlook is oh, excellent. Oh, okay, that's really, that's <laughs> quite <laughs> a relief. <laughs> Don't worry, be yeah. happy. All right. They're not going to cut it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Liz, you want to join in? You want to jump on that, that question? <laughs> well, I think that um, whether it's low-cost carriers or your, your chopper service, yeah. I think the fact that people want um, less crowded, lesser known destinations, the ecotourism, nature-based tourism, you know, those are all rising trends post-pandemic. So, yeah. you know, I mentioned yes, that there right. are more silver linings. All right. So I think any connectivity that helps disperse travelers, um, you know, is opportunity. That's still opportunity. I have, okay. Thank you. Thank you. I have Thank a weird you. idea. Since we're talking about eco-friendly stuff and all, can we start hiking from one country to a country? That's eco-friendly. And we're all going to lose weight. Hiking. <laughs> Can yes. we start promoting? Yeah. <laughs> Can we start just walking? <laughs> that should work too. Okay, anyone with another question? Thank you, Mr. Kalpa. Any questions? Okay, good. We're right on time. So your before I let you guys go, is there anything in particular you want customers to consider as we all try to recover together and reconnect? <coughs> I go with you, Liz. Oh, so many things. I mean, this recovery is an all-out effort <coughs> from public and private. And the thing I would say is, first of all, as Pata, you know, one of the things we, we shared with um, part of the Indonesia ministry is a tourism destination resilience training program. Any of you can take it. It's online, 10 to 15 hours. And this is basically helping our destinations get ready and build capacity and prepare for other kinds of impacts. Because the thing that we know 100% is that this was not the last crisis. You know, we've all in the region dealt with tsunami, but in earthquakes, um, volcanic eruptions, floods. So the important thing is for us to build resilience. Um, and, and this training makes us aware. And it also t teaches us how do we preserve a place, the next Bali, how do we preserve it and take on more travelers? And so making sure it keeps its integrity. So that's super important. Mr. Clifford? So uh, two things, really. Firstly, um, we want to learn the lessons from this last pandemic and then, uh, and then so that we can approach the next pandemic um, a lot more effectively. Sorry, I, it's something just came to mind now. Why was this particular disaster a real disaster, disruptive? <laughs> because I as you mentioned, you know, we've had all kinds of disasters before, but this one seemed to have taken a toll, a very heavy toll. Yeah, you could, you could compare it to SARS. We had SARS in right. 2003, <coughs> and you saw a V-shaped uh, dip and recovery. This one went down, and then it just carried on down. Why? So, what do you uh, think? Closure of borders. Well, this was, you know, m many of you have seen, this was predicted. The fact that mankind has infringed so much on the biodiversity of nature, this was anticipated. It was a question of when unfortunately. And so I think it's similar to the, all the red flags that we have about climate change. We need mm. to start having more respect for science. our natural environment. And science. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so you know, it, the great thing is that I do think, I mean, it's, it needs to accelerate faster, but there is movement across all elements of our industry. I'm even hearing in hotel investors say, oh, we would love for governments to say, you know, give us some guidelines around CapEx and what we should invest in ESG. Even ho hotel investors who normally just think about profitability and five to seven year return, they are on the bandwagon for ESG and supporting um, sustainability goals at the construction level, at the design and construct. So that to me tells me it's going from words into action mm. in a deeper way than it did pre-pandemic. We still need to accelerate, but we need to, um, 
you know, it's in the right direction. All right, Mr. Cronwright, sorry, I had to quickly jump in on that question, so go on. No, no, no problem, no problem. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because uh, exactly as Liz said, there is going to be another pandemic. So we'd oh better my make God. sure. Well, there will be. So let's make sure that when the next one comes, oh we, we, we've learned the lessons from, from this occasion. Mm -hmm. And this was the subject of a lot of debate um, at the recent ICAO assembly, because it's recognized that there are lessons to be learned, and we need, to, we need to learn those lessons before the next one comes. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is um, working together. I think it's tremendously important as we, um, as we come out of this pandemic that everybody works together. I, I loved what we saw in the minister's uh, presentation there about bringing all the stakeholders together in this fantastic industry of ours. We should all be working together to make the most of the opportunities. There's huge pent up demand. Uh, we need to satisfy that demand and we need to make the world a better place. And that's what tourism is all about. And ladies and gentlemen, on that note, we are wrapping up this wonderful session, restoring connectivity to recover. I'd like to say a special thanks to my brilliant panelists, the Senior Vice President and Deputy Director General, International Airport and Transport Association, IATA, Mr. Conrad Clifford. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause. Oh, <laughs> and of course, the Chief Executive Officer, Pacific Asia Travel Association, Pata, Liz Oteguera. Thank you. And of course, myself. Ah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I'm handing over to my co-host. May we have a group photo first, please?